So was buying this airplane with these wings a mistake that's going to cost me $30,000? Oh, I hope not. <laughs> Okay, so what happened? When I bought the airplane, as I talked about in a previous video, did a lot of research on the airplane, poured through the logbooks, poured through all the airworthiness directives, the compliance with those over the years. Everything looked great on that. Felt really comfortable with the airplane. And for a variety of reasons, some that I just mentioned, as you see in the previous video, I decided not to do the pre-buy inspection on the airplane. It just didn't make sense to me since it just came out of annual to take it all apart again to do that. So I didn't do that. And as I mentioned, that was a little bit risky and I would highly recommend for anyone else considering it that you go ahead and do the pre-buy inspection just for the peace of mind. So the airplane just had its annual inspection done and that actually went fine. Uh, annual inspection went really good um, as far as any kind of, you know, major issues, defects, anything like that. A couple minor things that I had fixed, which is kind of typical when you have your annual inspection done. And um, as far as the cost on it, you know, I was kind of forecasting somewhere between maybe fifteen, twenty-five hundred dollars $2,500, somewhere in that range for an airplane like this. And, and that was pretty much spot on. For the annual inspection and the minor repairs that were done to it, it ended up being about $2,200 all in. So that wasn't bad at all. The issue is um, there's an airworthiness directive that is airworthiness directive 2020-2616. Um, I'll provide a link to that in the video description below. And that is related to the wing spars on a variety of Piper airplanes. And um, as we talk about this, I'll go through that full list Put that on screen so you can see if yours is covered in there. But essentially, what has happened, first was in 1987, there was a Piper aircraft that had a wing come off in flight. That was an aircraft, if I got my history straight on that, that was doing power line, pipeline inspection kind of stuff. Basically low level flying where you're bouncing around a lot. That puts a lot of stress on the uh, on the wing spars. And there was a separation of that wing in flight. I think at the time it was kind of looked at as a one-off, so there wasn't bells and whistles going off to, to put out an AD or anything like that. Uh, later in 1993, there was another accident similar to that. And then more recently, in 2018, there was an accident at Embry-Riddle Aviation University where a flight instructor and his student went up in the airplane, I believe, to do a check ride, and they had an aircraft wing separate in flight, resulting in fatalities, unfortunately. That accident is what spurred the current state of this airworthiness directive. The first two aircraft that I mentioned had had dive penetration inspections done on the wing spars, and those did not reveal anything. It's believed that that you know would not have detected the cracks that led to these accidents. So the NTSB and the FAA and the manufacturer and everyone worked together and came up with a new process uh, of a way to try to detect these type of issues. And so that's a lot of the language that's in this uh, airworthiness directive. So how do you know if you need to have this done? Well, obviously, if your Piper aircraft is on the list, which is most low wing Piper aircraft over the years, um, it's, it's, it's quite an extensive list. So most people that have an aircraft similar to mine, PA-28s, PA-32s, PA-161s, 180s, all that, um, you're probably in that list. And you can take a look at the Airworthiness Directive and see if you are, in fact, in there. So what are the required steps of this Airworthiness Directive? Well, the first one is to determine whether or not you need to do any kind of calculation at all. And that means that you have an aircraft that has at least 5,000 hours of time in service. So basically 5,000 hours total time, you're going to be doing something, not necessarily costing you money yet, but there's some things that you want to do. So what the, what the FAA came up with was a scenario where the most likely candidates for this issue are aircraft that have been used in flight school operations because of all the up and down cycles, the landings, which, you know, 
especially for, for newer pilots, right? Those landings can be pretty hard. And more importantly, there's a lot of landings versus an individual who bought an airplane brand new and just flew it on their own from here to there and you know landed it a few times a month, a week, whatever. So the first step is looking at your log books to see if and how many 100 hour inspections were done as opposed to just annual inspections on the airframe. Because 100 hour inspections are indicative of an airplane that's been in a flight school environment. And we're not talking about the 100 hour engine inspections because that's standard. We're talking about the annual, when you do the annual inspection on the airframe itself, that's normally done on a 12 month interval for just an individual like myself. But when it's in a school environment or being used for, for hire like that, now you're looking at the 100 hour inspections. So first step is going and finding out how many of those you've had over the life of the aircraft and if you've, if you've had any of those. And then the FAA came up with a formula to take the total time of your aircraft, how many 100 hour inspections it's had and do some computations and come up with what they call factored service hours. And so, for example, an aircraft, and, and there's an example that the FAA has in here, you have an aircraft that has 12,100 hours total time on the airframe, but this thing has never had a 100-hour inspection done. It's always been annual inspection, so it's never been used for hire in a flight school or any environment like that. So if you plug those numbers into their formula, what you come up with is 711 factored service hours. Now the FAA set a threshold and said, if you've had 5,000 factored service hours, which this is obviously well short of that, then you're gonna need to get an eddy current inspection done on the aircraft. But until you hit the 5,000 hours, you don't have to have that inspection done on the aircraft. As opposed to that, another example that they have in here is an aircraft that has 10,600 total hours on the airframe, um, but it's had 55 100 hour inspections performed over its life. And if you plug that into the formula, even though it's got 10,600 total hours, when you then put in the 55 100 hour inspections into the formula, you come up with a factored service hour of 5,800 hours. So this aircraft needs to have the eddy current inspection done to it. So what's involved in the eddy current inspection? It's pretty straightforward. Um, if you look at your wing spar, there are bolts on the top of the wing spar on each side and there are bolts on the bottom. Uh, the bolts on the bottom are accessible from underneath the aircraft. As you can see in the picture here, this is someone performing that inspection on my aircraft. This inspection for the AD is done on the outermost wing spar bolt because that is the one that has failed in all these incidents. Um, and it's the most critical one, obviously. So um, they take that bolt out. They have kind of this magic wand that goes up in there and it spins around and sends out magnetic resonance. And they have a little meter that they calibrate beforehand. And that'll tell them if there are cracks that are in there that wouldn't be detectable by the naked eye or by dye penetration or any other means. If you come back with cracks, you have to replace the wing spar. Replacing the wing spar and a piper like mine is in the ballpark of $15,000 per wing. So that led to my question, did I just make a $30,000 mistake by not having a pre-buy inspection to check this out before I bought the airplane? Well, as I mentioned, I didn't do the pre-buy for the reasons that I outlined, and I knew that all the airworthiness directives had been complied with. This airworthiness directive had been complied with on my airplane because my aircraft does not hit the 5,000 hour threshold. So all that needed to be done to comply with the airworthiness directive for me initially was to do the factored service hour calculation. So my airframe had about 5,700 hours on it total time, and it had a small history of time in flight schools decades ago. And when you ran the calculations on it, it came out to around 4,000 factored service hours. So still a thousand hours short of needing the eddy current inspection to be done. Therefore, the airworthiness directive 
to that point had been complied with, with another thousand hours to go before the eddy current inspection was needed. So, I could technically continue to fly the airplane, and I'm complying with the airworthiness directive. However, I don't want to wait a thousand hours to find out if there's a crack in my wing and the wing's going to fall off because, I don't know, wings feel like they're an important component to the airplane. So, um, I decided while the aircraft is down for its annual inspection to go ahead and have the eddy current inspection done and check it out. I'd rather know now and, and deal with it than fly around for the next thousand hours wondering what's happening with my wings. So, worked with my AMP to contract with an individual. It's not just an AMP that does this. The, the, the people that come around to do the eddy current inspections are specifically certified in doing this inspection. They're a much higher level certification for that kind of thing. And they've got very specialized equipment and a very specialized process to do this. So this is not something that your AMP does for you. However, there are a number of people out there that can do that. And the cost is not bad to have the eddy current inspection done. It ended up costing me $500 for the individual to come out and perform the eddy current inspection. So that's not bad and that's not scary. <laughs> What's scary is whether or not my aircraft will pass the eddy current inspection or if there are indeed cracks in my wing spar. The good news is, according to the FAA and according to most of the people I've talked to, including the individual doing the eddy current inspection, very few aircraft, even with extremely high times, 15, 17,000 hours total time in service, very few percentage-wise are coming back with cracks and failing the 80 current inspection. So, fingers crossed on that. So again, if cracks are found, you have to replace the wing spar. Um, and that can either be with a brand new wing spar, a zero hours time in service, according to the FAA, or it can have more than zero hours. So it can be a used wing spar, which may be a little bit cheaper, provided that that wing spar has had the eddy current test performed and has passed and there are no cracks in it. So either way, you can do that to comply with the AD if you have to replace the wing spar because you do have cracks in it. If you don't have cracks in it, once they complete the eddy current, you need to have new bolts put in your wing spar, which they're not cheap bolts. I think they're about 50, 40, 50 bucks a piece, um, but uh, it's your wing, so, you know, and nothing's cheap in aviation anyway, as we all know. Um, so that's the next step once it does pass that. So, what happened with my airplane? Did I pass the eddy current inspection? Let me just say that while I'm watching the individual lying on his back with a probe stuck up my wing holes, uh, you pretty much feel like you want to vomit at that point, right? Um, yeah, not pleasant. However, I have a pass on all my wing spar holes. So all the bolt holes came back good, no cracks detected in any of those. So hallelujah Christmas day for that. Plane is good to go, live to fly another day. So that's good, I'm very happy about that. So once the, uh, once the eddy current inspection is done, there's some paperwork. It's actually attached to this airworthiness directive, but the individual coming out to do your airworthiness or to you do your eddy current inspection uh, will have the paperwork as well. It's some paperwork that gets filed with the FAA and also back with Piper so they can keep records of all this stuff. In addition to whether or not you pass the inspection, they also want to know the factored service hours, total time in service, all that stuff. Um, because this is an ongoing thing, it's an evolving airworthiness directive. The way I described it is the state that it is at the time you're watching this. As the FAA gets more information, feedback from all the inspections being done, they may start changing some of the thresholds on when and which aircraft need to have this done. So that could change over time, but the way it, the way it is right now is the way I've described it. So, <sighs> sigh of relief for me my airplane's okay. And so all in $2,700 for the annual inspection plus having the eddy current inspection done. <sighs> Dodged a bullet, I think. Anyway, 
if you've had this done, if you're going to have this done, if you know someone that had this done, um, or if you've got a piper and you've got questions about it, leave those in the comments below. Um, I'll answer what I can. Other people can can share their experience as well. But definitely leave, leave some stuff in the comments below. Um, and of course, if you're enjoying the video and you're enjoying the content that we've got on the channel, please give us a thumbs up, like, subscribe to the channel. Um, lots more future content on its way. Um, aircraft's been stripped down and uh, cleaned out, insulation in. So check that out in the next video. And uh, you can see the progress that we're making as we restore this, uh, this Piper Arrow and bring the interior back to life. Thanks so much for watching. We'll see you on the next video.